Today, we are thankful. We give thanks to God for His love, His mercy, and His faithfulness. We give thanks for family and friends, life and laughter, and the little things which bring joy to our lives. We give thanks for our circumstances, even when they're difficult. For we know the hand of God guides us through it all. But what if we remembered thankfulness every day? What if we lived in a constant state of gratitude? Would our lives be different? Would our faith be strengthened? Would the things of God permeate every aspect of our lives? The Bible tells us to give thanks in everything. What would life look like if we actually lived that out? Today, we are reminded of all we have to be thankful for. May that gratitude move our hearts and cause us to make every day thanksgiving. Hey there, Ford Alliance, our extended digital family. Great to have you with us this Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, something that I have made a daily part of my morning routine is being grateful or offering up Thanksgiving. And in this season, I have found it to be critical for my soul to do that every day. And so I would really encourage you as we uh, celebrate Thanksgiving weekend to make it a habit right now of offering up gratitude, of being thankful, of recognizing what, what God has done uh, in your life and in this season. That has been hard. It's, it's just so important to count those blessings. Uh, this morning, we do have a, a special guest with us. His name is Graham Crawford. He's a longtime a friend and a part of our church fellowship. And he serves in Senegal, Africa at Dakar Academy. And he's going to give us a bit of an update on his mission there. And then he's going to pick up the next line in the Lord's Prayer for us. And so we're really looking forward uh, to him sharing a bit about what's going on in his personal journey and unpacking uh, the Lord's Prayer with us as well. And then finally, the formal part of the morning. Um, our AGM is coming up, and uh, you can access our, our annual general, general report um, through our MailChimp newsletter. It was just sent out this week. Please make sure to go through and look. We've got some uh, big things we want to work through and process together, including just the reworking of our bylaws, which are incredibly outdated, and we need to, to make sure these things are up to snuff. So just want to make sure uh, you were aware of that and, and had that with you. Uh, I'm just going to pause for a word of prayer as we get going and ask you to join me. Holy Papa, I really do want to sit here this morning and just be grateful. I want to thank you for the blessing of being in relationship with you. I want to thank you for the life of Jesus that modeled what it means to, to live for you, to serve and to, to lead as a servant. And I want to ultimately thank you for the cross that no matter what we're facing today, no matter what we're going through, we can know that you have extended your love and offered forgiveness and brought a way for us to be back in relationship with you so much so that we can pray like this even now. So thank you. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us digitally today. Be with Graham as he shares and as he speaks. Upon those who are uh, watching and doing so alone this Thanksgiving weekend. I just pray uh, an extra sense of your presence upon them, that they would know they are not alone, that you, Jesus, said you have, uh, would be with us always, even to the end of this age, and you are there with them. May they sense you, may they know you, uh, may they just feel your heart and your love for them today. In your name we pray, amen.
pictures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. The burning sun with golden beams. community that's here is so evident and my children notice that I notice it as a mom I notice it as a staff member that it's it's a genuine love a genuine Christ God honoring environment that is wonderful for your children I mean you couldn't ask for anything more for your children to grow up in that type of environment this is the healthiest place I've lived uh, because you have a community with a common purpose in mind common goals and trying 
to love each other well and trying to, to care for each other, support each other, and serve each other. I feel like a lot of people here are like brothers and sisters and like I've gotten to know them so closely that it's just like kind of like a family here. One of the big goals that I have in my classroom is to not to teach kids to know, but to teach them to learn. I think it's far more important to teach kids to fall in love with learning. The staff aren't here just to teach, they're here to educate students, they're here for the students. The primary focus of our secondary program is to really prepare kids for college in the States. To give them everything that they need as far as a good bone structure of an education to best be able to pursue any given field at any given college. Um, in that we do strive for academic excellence, but we also strive for a well-rounded person. My favorite part about being at DA is the opportunity. Here in Dakar, we have a special opportunity as it's a lot of culture and it just gives an opportunity to see a lot of the world without going very far, a lot of people, a lot of experiences. It's not just the same old, same old every day, sitting in the classroom, you know, from eight to three. There's just so many fun things and DA just goes above and beyond in planning those just to make memories, I think, for the students. The athletics community here plays a big part in making DA what it is. Almost everybody is involved in some kind of athletics, whether intramurals or varsity sports or something like that. It's not just a place where your kid's going to come and learn, which is extremely important. You want them to advance academically, but they're going to come and see uh, the gospel lived out. A lot of viewpoints in Christianity, each person comes from a different side on a different topic of the debate, but there's definitely a lot of freedom to discuss and debate those things, no matter where you come from. It ends up creating a place, I think, with a lot of acceptance, a place where you, you can have the freedom to be different. I think without DA, I would not be able to see myself where I am today. Spiritually, there's a lot of buildup that has come over the years and I think there's a lot of different experiences that I've had in the school that I, I don't think I would have had anywhere else. DA is a school where they strive to teach not just academics but they try to round the entire individual. It has kind of like helped me know who I am and has helped me be able to build my character and be able to strengthen myself in areas that I wasn't strong in. We're not just interested in their academic success, we're interested in their entire successes. And I think that's something you can't really get anywhere else. Okay, well, I'll say good morning. I'm not sure exactly when people are going to be watching this online, but uh, it's good to be here in uh, Fort Saskatchewan at the Alliance Church here. Uh, it's good to see a few faces around as well, and being you have a chance to talk with a few people, that's been great. Um, I thought I would start off because there's going to be some people that don't know me. Uh, my name is Graham Crawford. Uh, I'm a missionary currently serving in Dakar, Senegal in West Africa. Since it's likely that there, oh sorry, I thought I'd take some time to uh, tell you a little bit about myself so, I can, so you can better understand the journey I've been on and uh, how I even got to the point of becoming a missionary. Um, I'm originally from Fort McMurray, Alberta. Yes, uh, contrary to popular belief, people are actually born in Fort McMurray. They don't all just show up there. Uh, I always find it funny people act so surprised at times when I say I was, I was born there. Uh, it's like I'm an anom anomaly or something like that. 
Um, But it's true, I was born, I was raised there by God's provision in a Christian home with loving parents. Um, Now my journey thus far as a Christian is kind of like West Edmonton Mall. There's uh, phases um, to it, three distinct ones to be exact. Uh, Phase one began when I was six years old. I prayed that the Lord would become my savior. My God's, by God's provision, I had heard about hell from my parents and Sunday school, uh, my Sunday school teachers, and I definitely didn't want to go there. So I prayed that the Lord would save me from hell and forgive me of my sins. Then I thought I was done. The Lord, um, whenever I asked if I had accepted, whenever I was asked if I had accepted Jesus into my heart, I would just politely say yes, and everyone seemed happy. It wasn't until I was 15 years of age that phase two began when I heard from my youth youth pastor that God didn't want to just save me from hell, but he wanted to have a relationship with me. So through God's provision, I spoke to my mother about it, and she prayed with me that Jesus would become not just my savior, but my friend. And from that day on, I I began an actual relationship with God. After high school, uh, I left Fort McMurray to begin college at Nate uh, in Edmonton. I graduated two years later with an instrumentation engineering diploma, which enabled me to get the dream job of many kids growing up in Alberta, working in the oil industry. The big money. <laughs> uh, however, the Lord had other plans for me. After just a few months of working in the oil industry, Uh, Through God's provision, I was in a potentially fatal car crash on Moose Row, Highway 43, on the way up there to Grand Prairie. As you can tell, the crash wasn't fatal, but it woke me up to where I was in that moment. I'd really wandered away um, from the Lord during my time at Tech College and uh, on the oil rigs. I began to wonder where I would have gone if I died in that car accident. And I really felt that I didn't deserve to go to heaven. So like the prodigal son, uh, I prayed. I earnestly asked Jesus to become my Lord and lead me wherever he wanted me to be. In many ways, I had decided for myself um, what I would do, where I would go in my life up to that point. And I never seeked God for direction. I just basically said, here's what I'm doing, God. Um, If you could bless it, that would be sweet. Um, However, on that day, phase three of my Christian journey began as I made God the Lord of my life. So the phases are Savior, Friend, and Lord. Um, And I gave him control. And this was a life-changing decision for me. Through God's provision, he ended up leading me to Bible College in BC for two years, and then to a pastoral internship on Vancouver Island. Things were going great. However, something unexpected happened. I was, I was not confident that the Lord was calling me to be a pastor. So confused, yet through God's provision, I felt led to go back to tech college uh, to work in a field I was interested in, information technology, or IT for short. I loved it. So after about two years and another graduation at Nate, I now had a uh, diploma in computer engineering technology. I began working in the IT industry here in Canada, but there was something missing. There was an emptiness to it. I missed being involved in full-time ministry. Through God's provision, the Lord intervened again in my life by organizing an encounter with missionaries when I was working on Vancouver Island. This encounter was the first time that I had heard of a need for IT people on the mission field. It wasn't something that got a lot of press. Um, Fascinated that I could have something to offer the mission world, I began pursuing it. Through some incredible circumstances, the Lord led me to Botswana, Africa, in southern Africa, where I would work for a medical flying mission as an IT specialist for 11 years. Seems hard to believe even for me. (laughs) Through God's provision, he organized a meeting with the woman who would become my wife in 2015. I left Botswana that same year. I got married and moved with her to Benin, Africa to begin a brand new ministry there. We were so excited to be serving together as a couple in Africa, and we're excited to see what the Lord 
would do during our time there. However, our time was cut short. Almost right away, we began struggling in Benin. After my wife went through a traumatic event where she was exposed to HIV positive blood while she was pregnant with our first son, we ended up having to leave Benin uh, after only 10 months in country. This was a very difficult time for my wife and I, but through God's provision, he once again showed up in a massive way. He healed my wife's anxiety. He gave her a desire to once again head back to Africa to try and make a difference for the kingdom. Through God's provision, we were led to Senegal to serve at a missionary school there called Dakar Academy. Uh, So in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, (laughs) we moved our family to Dakar, Senegal in August 2020. Kathleen began working as the school nurse. I began working in the school's IT department. We love it there. Um, For those who don't know me, I love uh, playing the drums. Since COVID-19 basically shut down all the churches in Senegal, we started having our own church services on campus uh, with staff and dorm students. I played the drums pretty much every week. Uh, I also started playing for school chapels, which I really enjoyed. It gave me a chance to to play alongside some of the kids and the students. We were able to create connections with local people in our neighborhood. One of the ladies that helped prepare meals for us, um, she had her baby die three months after it was born. Uh, We were able to minister to her and encourage her. We also started to get to know some of the students and see some come to Christ and others grow in their faith. So for a year that I think many of you can (laughs) Uh, feel for that uh, for a year filled with turmoil it was a very fulfilling year at Dakar Academy during the year we discovered that my wife was pregnant uh, with our second child Kathleen started going to the doctor on a regular basis the doctor noticed a problem he determined that Kathleen was going to deliver prematurely our first son Austin was also born prematurely he was six weeks early Uh, He recommended we don't have the baby in Senegal. The hospital there does not have a neonatal intensive care unit, so he recommended we have the baby back in Canada where the baby could receive uh, better medical care. We spoke with the school administration, and they gave us permission to spend the first uh, first semester of the school here in Canada so that Kathleen could deliver the baby here. So through God's provision, we left Senegal on June 15th, July 16th. Duncan, our second son, was born. His due date was September 6th, so he was seven and a half weeks early. Through God's provision, I'm pleased to say everything went smoothly. Mother and baby are doing well. Uh, Currently, I'm working remotely to support uh, the school. I do that Monday to Friday. Kathleen is currently on maternity leave. Uh, and she hopes to begin working at the school again next school year. Uh, We're not sure if this is going to be a possibility. Uh, The school has already hired another school nurse uh, for this school year. So during Kathleen's absence, we'll uh, we'll see if she can find another ministry potentially to be involved with. We're not exactly sure how that's going to work out. Um, We'll see how the Lord leads. Lord willing, we're returning to plan to Senegal. We're returning to we're planning to return to Senegal at the beginning of January. Now, I didn't tell you all that because I, I don't know how to write a sermon. <laughs> if you were listening closely, I repeated a short phrase a number of times during my story. I don't know if anybody knows what those words are. If you're listening, it was through God's provision. So that's the theme I'm going to be aiming at this morning as we move along here. Uh, As you may or may not know, the church is doing a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. Today we're going to be focusing on a single verse in the Lord's Prayer, which I'm going to read for you now. It's from Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, and it reads as follows. Give us today our daily bread. Today, bread. Bread. How many of you prayed that the Lord would provide bread for you today? Did anybody do that when they woke up this morning? Lord, can you give me bread today? 
I didn't. Uh, but to let us all off the hook a bit, I don't think that's what Jesus was teaching his disciples. Uh, he wasn't just telling them to pray for bread every day. There's nothing wrong with praying for bread uh, on a daily basis, but I think Jesus was trying to make a bigger point uh, than just to pray that your stomach would be filled. In fact, bread was a powerful symbol of God's provision for his people in the Bible. One example of this that people probably know well is when the Lord literally rained bread from heaven to feed the Israelites when they were wandering the desert. This story can be found in Exodus 16. I'm going to read a little bit for it, uh, of it for you here now, starting in verse 13. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Then down to verse 31, the people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Jesus Christ himself referred to himself as the bread of life. In John chapter 3, verse 35, it says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus alone is the one who can satisfy our deepest needs and longings. Have, ever, uh, have any of you ever heard of the term breadwinner? Who's the breadwinner in your house? Even in our modern Western culture, we're used to using the word bread to symbolize provision. And this to me is what the Lord's trying to teach his disciples. He's teaching them to come to him in a spirit of humility, to ask him to provide what they need to sustain them from day to day. This doesn't mean that we simply ask for riches and he provides them. God's not a, a vending machine. That's not what I'm suggesting. Uh, he's encouraging us to make our needs known and to trust him to provide those needs. Sometimes the needs in our life just seem to pile up. Maybe you yourself are waiting on the Lord for something. Maybe you've been praying for help, praying for a breakthrough. Maybe you feel that the Lord has been slow in answering your prayers. Maybe you just don't see a way out of your current situation. Maybe you've lost hope. Maybe you feel alone. Um, maybe you're struggling with stress and you're not sure if you can take it much more. Well, there's good news, brothers and sisters. I'm going to read another verse from Philippians, chapter 4, verse 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Whatever your need is, I believe that the Lord cares and is able to provide what you need. He may not provide it in the way you want. I don't think God's big on supplying wants. It's our needs he's interested in, and he knows our needs better than we do, which I think is a difficult concept for us sometimes to grasp. I'm going to tell you a little story to illustrate this. After the car accident um, that I referred to earlier in my story, I ended up on my knees in a shack on an oil rig in northwestern Alberta. It was there that I prayed for the Lord to guide me. I didn't know what to do. All I knew is I needed the Lord's help. And he answered me, literally, this has only happened to me one time in my life, but I heard an audible voice from the Lord to tell me to go to Bible college. That was it. And it was kind of weird. Um, I totally <laughs> related to Samuel, where the Lord kept uh, calling to him, and he goes to Eli, thinking it's him. That's exactly what it was like for me. I, I didn't really know what was going on. But eventually, like Samuel, I came to my senses and I just thought, this is the Lord. <laughs> and what do I do? Do I do what he says, or do I not? Now, at that point in my life, I had absolutely no, no interest in going to Bible college, so I was pretty sure this was not coming from me, this wasn't my own idea. I was 21 years old, I was making more money than most people I knew, even my father. 
um, why would I go to Bible college? I didn't even like Sunday school, to be honest. Now I have to pay to do the adult version of Sunday school. Um, it didn't seem very appealing. So here I am. I had just prayed for guidance, and the Lord literally tells me to go somewhere I didn't want to go. Go figure. This is where faith comes in. In faith, I decided to quit my job and go to Bible college. This was difficult. It was a difficult time for me. I had applied and was accepted to go to Bible college in BC, which was great. Um, and I was still working on the oil rigs. Now, I had to go to my boss to try to explain why I was leaving the company. My boss' name was Curtis. I went to his office, and well, basically, I was there to give my notice. And I really didn't want to tell him the whole story. So the spin I put on it was that I said I was going back to school to improve myself. Eh, something like that. <laughs> Curtis then says to me, good decision, young fella. Nothing wrong with getting a solid education. What school are you going to? What are you going to take? He was assuming I'd be taking chemical engineering or power engineering or something like that. And I sheepishly said, uh, I'm going to Bible college. Curtis's face changed to one of confusion his question back to me was an interesting one. Which Bible? And I, I, I didn't know how to answer him. <laughs> I just said, the holy one? <laughs> I said, he said, are you going to become some sort of priest or something? I said, I hope not. And he said, why are you doing this? And I said, because God told me to. Curtis shook his head. From that point forward, until I left the company, everybody I worked with wanted to tease me about going to Bible college. Coworkers would walk up to me and say, I hear you're going to become a Catholic priest or something like that. It was rough. Uh, when I finally left the oil rigs and was driving to BC to go to Bible college, I remember praying to the Lord to just try to confirm with him that this was really what he wanted me to do. At this point in my life, I had a little bit of a, a potty mouth, uh, and there were times I would actually swear as I was praying, and uh, it just showed where I was at at the time. I even remember praying that the Lord would take this foul language out of my mouth, because I just felt like I was going to offend everybody on campus. I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was struggling with completely trusting the Lord in this whole endeavor, but through the doubt, I trusted him through this whole process. And I'm telling you, I'm glad I did. I spent two wonderful years at Bible school, fell right back in love with God, and it was exactly what I needed, even though I didn't know it at the time. Our single greatest need is Jesus. Our daily bread is him. And at a certain point in my life, I had forgotten that, or at the very least needed to learn it again. One of the things I try to do on a daily basis so I don't forget that is I try to stay in his word. I don't do anything crazy. Uh, I know I'm a missionary. I don't fast for 40 days and, you know, get up at 3 a.m. every day to pray. Um, I keep it kind of simple. <laughs> in the mornings, I usually do our daily bread devotions. Um, at the end of the devotion, it usually has chapters of the Bible you can read, so you can go through the entire Bible uh, in one year. I, I usually do that. It only takes about 30 minutes, you know, to do the devotion. At the end of the day, I usually spend an extended time in prayer before going to bed. Uh, it's changed a little bit in my life. Uh, as my life has changed, just different scenarios from being signaled, single to married to being a parent, uh, I haven't always done the same thing, and this is going to be something that is different for different people, but I try to give the Lord my best. And it's, it's not always perfect, but it keeps me connected to God by being in his word and speaking to him each day. Maybe you're thinking today, Graham, I, I don't know what I need. I don't even know where to start in asking God, God's help in my life. What, what is it that I need? 
My suggestion to you would be to just ask God to show you what your needs are. It reminds me of a friend I met in Africa. I like telling stories, so I'm going to try to tell stories. I find they're more entertaining. Um, this, uh, this friend, it's a kind of a personal story, so I'm going to use an alias for him. I'm just going to call him Peter. It's not his real name. In 2012, while I was living in Botswana, I went on holiday and I stayed at a backpackers. I don't know if you know what a backpackers is. It's like a hostel, a place that travelers go. It's usually very cheap and you live kind of in a, a big room with a whole bunch of beds. And uh, the backpackers was managed by Peter. I really enjoyed spending time with him. Uh, we would go to the market to get food. He taught me a little bit of the local language. We had a lot of fun hanging out. One day we were coming back from the market and he says to me, I have to stop at the Rasta, right? You might not know what a Rasta is. Maybe you've heard of Rastafarian. Uh, if you don't know what Rastafarian is, feel free to go home, get out your Google and uh, look it up. Uh, some of you would have heard of Bob Marley. Um, I knew exactly what this meant when he said it. And he was going to go and buy marijuana. These are the stories that usually don't make missionary prayer letters, okay? Uh, but when we got to the backpackers, Peter lit up his marijuana and he started smoking it. And I asked him, Peter, why do you do that? Um, first of all, Peter was not wealthy at all. In fact, he probably was in a financial bind. Why, why are you wasting your hard-earned money on this thing that you're just gonna smoke up? His response was, it takes the edge off. And I, I didn't know what that meant. I, <laughs> I had to ask him, like, what, what edge, what, what do you mean? He then started to tell me the story of his life, kind of much like I did <laughs> earlier in this sermon. And folks, it was brutal. Um, when Peter was younger, he ended up getting in a fight. He nearly beat a man to death. This landed him in prison, and just imagine for a sec, this is not prison in Canada, this is prison in Africa. When he was in prison, he was attacked by a group of men. The outcome led to him contracting HIV. One, uh, it gets worse. <laughs> After serving his sentence in prison, he got out and he met this beautiful woman that he felt very deeply in love with. And one night, things got a little bit out of hand, and Peter ended up passing his HIV onto his girlfriend, and she died. When he finished telling the story, a part of me wanted to say, you know what, man, pass that thing over here, because that's about the, <laughs> the saddest story I had ever heard. Um, I didn't, <laughs> but, Instead, Peter asked me, well, how do you deal with life's troubles when they come, Graham? Friends used to always ask me, what's your poison, you know? What is it that you need or what is it that you use to deal with life's problems? Everybody's got poison. What's yours? I told him, whenever I have an issue, I take it to the Lord in prayer. And it unburdens me. It helps remind me that I'm not in this alone. I have a God who cares for me, who protects me. Peter then began to tell me that when he was younger, he believed in God, but he always pushed him away. During the rest of my stay, we talked uh, a lot about God. I tried to encourage him to follow him and be in a relationship with him and let him be his Lord. When I left, all he said to me is, you've given me a lot to think about. Years went by, I received a Facebook message from him. He had sent it to all his contacts. It read very much like a suicide note, and I freaked out. Uh, I, I messaged him back, I tried calling him, he wouldn't answer. Uh, I finally heard from a friend of his that he was okay and was just really struggling with life. I lost track of him for a bit, but recently, and this is actually very recently, uh, I was finally able to get a hold of him and talk to him on WhatsApp. He told me that the day he considered killing himself was the day the Lord woke him up. 
Kind of like when I crashed my truck into the ditch, God had really gotten his attention. I'm thrilled that I can now say, my friend Peter is walking with the Lord. He admits he still struggles, it's hard. He admitted, he said, every once in a while I still go to the Rusta. And, uh, but he now has a God he can go to with every need. He has. And the Lord has blessed him. This one I couldn't believe. Um, and this is where I kind of wanted to keep it anonymous due to kind of immigration issues. His wife is not his wife. She's actually illegally in the country. So um, he's not able to just go and get licenses and all these things because they would be revealing things they would prefer not to reveal. It's a difficult situation. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he, he calls her his wife. And he says, I, I, I have no plans of leaving her. I love her. They have five children together. Th- that amazed me. I said, Peter, you're, you're HIV positive. I'm like, where are these kids coming from? I just said, this seems reckless <laughs> to me. And he said, uh, yes, but the Lord has protected my wife and my kids. They're all negative. And it, I, I just felt like if God can help Peter and his family with their needs, I believe he can help you with yours. So in summary, maybe you're waiting on the Lord for something, maybe you've been praying for help, for for a breakthrough, maybe you feel that the Lord has been slow in answering you, maybe you just don't know a way out of your current situation, maybe you've lost hope, maybe you feel alone, maybe you're struggling with stress and you just feel like you can't take it anymore. Well, I'm here to tell you, God cares for you. He wants you to come to him in humility and ask him for your daily bread. God's provision is there. May we have the courage to ask him for it. I think maybe it's appropriate to close in prayer. So let's do that now. Father, we thank you that you are um, the ultimate provider. Even when we don't know what we need, we can come to you, Lord, and say, Lord, Help me. I, I don't even know what it is I need. I think I do, but I might have it wrong. And so, Lord, I pray that you would lead us in this, that we would be reminded day by day that you are our daily bread. And, Father, may we go out and tell the world about how you are that daily bread and how you can provide for the needs of others. In Jesus' name, amen. perfect it is for us to, on this Thanksgiving weekend, consider that line from the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Give us this day our daily bread. And may you, may I just take the time uh, to be thankful this day for the way in which God has provided. We love you. It was great to have you here. Blessings on your week.